All right. Hi. Hello. My name is Quinn. So just wanted to thank you all for coming out tonight and for showing up to here at Changing Hands. It's really lovely to have people out here. Um, so tonight we are joined by Mark Masters as he presents his latest book, High Bias, with Jason Woodbury. Jason is a writer, DJ, and record man based in the Sonoran Desert. Woodbury was, has previously served as music editor for the long-running alt-weekly Phoenix New Times, contributed to the Arizona Republic, and hosted the Audio Ranch radio program with Arizona music historian John Dixon. He's the creative director of Hello Merch, where he oversees the AV wing of Wastoids. Now, for tonight, we have Mark, who is a music journalist whose work has appeared on NPR and in the Washington Post, Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, and Bandcamp Daily. He's the co-host of the Spindle Podcast and host of the Music Book Podcast, so please welcome Mark and Jason. Basic, Hi, everybody. Basic gist of that is we both have a bunch of podcasts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For, uh, Mark works with Wastoids, and uh, if you're interested in what Wastoids is, we got some little flyers over there, but uh, we make podcasts and videos here, and Mark hosts a great show uh, about seven-inch records, not cassettes. What's no, going yeah. on? <laughs> yeah, I <l> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I betrayed cassettes with that seven. Yeah, we talk about a seven-inch every couple weeks on there. We're actually filming this for Wastoids right now. So. That's right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, Mark's book is one of the best music books of the year, something I've really enjoyed spending time with and covers such a cool topic. So I guess to kick things off, Maybe tell us a little bit about how, how how high bias the distorted history of the cassette tape came together and what, what scope you cover. Sure, yeah. So um, wh where to start with that? Um, <coughs> so I, I ha I've, I've been kicking around an idea about writing a book about cassettes for quite a while. And then just fortuitously, a friend of mine who actually runs a cassette label it was connected with the, the publisher who put this book out, and they were looking to put a book out about cassettes. So kind of serendipitously, we connected on that. Motivation-wise, I, I, I have always been into cassettes. I grew up listening to cassettes, taping songs off the radio, taping records for my friends, things like that. And, um, so, and I didn't really abandon them even when they kind of fell by the wayside somewhat as a format. And uh, recently, as you know well, a lot of smaller labels are going back to putting cassettes out because it's a cheaper, quicker way to do physical media than vinyl is right now. So, so I kind of thought that this was a good time to sort of see how we got to this point and how cassettes, what cassettes really meant back then and, and if, well, I, I know, but if <laughs> the the things that were valuable about them then are still kind of valuable today. Sure. I think they are. So. Yeah, I agree. I think over the last, you know, 15 years, you've seen this resurgence of interest in vinyl, you know, records, mm -hmm. LPs. And you keep hearing people ask, like, are cassettes going to make a similar kind of comeback and to me that sort of misses the point a little bit because like you said they've never really gone away the cassette has remained a format that people have interacted with what is it about it that's given it that kind of staying power there's always been an underground that's embraced cassettes right yeah, I mean, the, the the simple kind of surface fact is right now, they're like I said, they're cheaper to make. In fact, you can get a cassette back from the plant faster than you can get a record. But they've always kind of had a, a, a connotation of something a little more personal format than any other format. The fact that people use them right away to make mixtapes, to tape records from each other, to tape their own music onto tapes and dub them and give them to friends and sell them that way. I think there's always just been something about them that people feel kind of atta <coughs> excuse me, attached to more than maybe their vinyl collection. Not that there aren't some people who are crazily attached to their vinyl collections too, but the, the cassette is, has, has sort of an extra personal thing to it that I think <coughs> even people who are getting into cassettes now who didn't grow up with them can kind of sense from their history and from the fact that maybe their parents had a stash of them in the garage or something or right. um, with their handwriting all over it. And, you know, their handwriting isn't all over their records and CDs. So. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that the thing, probably my favorite element of the book is n not just the way you lay out the history and uh, particular artists and scenes that benefited from the cassette as a medium, but I think the thing that I like about it more than anything is the way you hone in on that idea of the cassette as 
the people's medium. It's a medium that like anybody can get their hands on. Um, it doesn't require any you know deep specialized knowledge to figure out how to tape a mm -hmm. song off the radio, mm -hmm. as evidenced by the fact that when I was in third grade, I was doing it fairly actively. You know, uh -huh. and uh, and beyond that, there's the possibility for the music to even be ephemeral on a cassette because you right. can you can tape over right. and and one tape can have all sorts of lives right and so there's this way that it feels to me of all the mediums um compact discs you know vinyl mm -hmm. whatever it feels the most adaptable the most yeah the most malleable to its users sort of ideas, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the most down and dirty format too, sort of the least precious. Like you, you know, when people bring, pull out a record, you don't see them doing that with a tape. Like, <laughs> you know, it's fine to get your fingers all over it. It's <laughs> even though it's more breakable in a way than other formats, uh, pe people didn't necessarily think of it as a permanent thing all the time. Although, you know, it's a heartbreaking when your tape breaks, but <laughs> yeah. there's always more out there. And uh, the possibility that you might even be able to repair it yourself, right? right? Like, Absolutely. which is one yeah. of the uh, the sort of uh, another one of the hackable uh, uh -huh. elements yeah. of of the cassette as a medium. Totally. You have a great quote in here. Uh, you're you're talking about you say the cassette tape is revolutionary. It's small. It's cheap. It's easy to use. And then you say, when a record gets scratched, it sounds annoying. When a tape warbles or flutters or wrinkles, it sounds kind of cool and <laughs> i was thinking about you know eno has that quote about how whatever trait you find undesirable in a medium will eventually be its signature um mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about that warble that slightly uh that slightly wonky quality that uh -huh. that cassettes have and was that when you were you know, young, did, did you find yourself attr attracted to that quality? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I definitely did. I, I mean, I'm attracted to weirder music like you are, so anything kind of weird and out of ordinary was always kind of attractive to me. But I, I also kind of liked the, the fact that as, as a young person, I was introduced to the fact that you can listen to stuff that's not pristine and not perfect and not, I mean, I think that helped just the fact that tapes were warbly and didn't sound the same every time kind of opened me up to the fact that you, you don't have to be too precious about how something sounds. Yeah. And then once I you know, got into college and beyond and started listening to bands who had recorded their stuff straight to cassette and dubbed it and sent it out on cassette, I, you start to realize that people are, you aren't using it just because it's cheap and easy. It's also because there's sort of an aesthetic to it. It, yeah. it fits the music that they're making, which is also weird and warbly and warped and, <laughs> you know, it adds to it in a lot of ways. Yeah, you talk about uh, Bruce Springsteen's album, Nebraska, mm -hmm. in the book. And Springsteen is, I'm, I'm a big Springsteen fan, and I like when there's like 13 people strumming electric guitars on stage as much as anybody. <laughs> but Nebraska is this record where it's sparse and it's quiet and it's just Bruce mm -hmm. and... It's very spooky sounding, and he had taped it on a, a, a task, was it Tascam Porta Studio, I think? Yeah, yeah, the four-track cassette recorder where you can just sort of record four tracks at home onto a cassette tape. His, his yeah. unit had previously, I think, even been dunked in water somehow. <laughs> uh, it was waterlogged. Uh, <laughs> but he taped, the, he taped the songs that comprised the record Nebraska onto that, that cassette four-track, and then took it to the band and was like, "All right, let's figure out how to make the record." And uh -huh. they couldn't. Right. They couldn't create the atmosphere right. that was captured on the uh, the tape. And I think that that gets to the the medium as mm -hmm. the message element, the sort of right. meta view of cassettes mm -hmm. is that those imperfections, those what uh, maybe a music engineer would call, you know, defects, right. are I end up being a quality that all sorts of music from lo-fi indie rock to mm -hmm. electronic to hip-hop, you know, mm -hmm. those are all forms that are benefited by the cassettes. Right. So th could tell, tell me a little bit about the bass resonance. Is ba cassettes are good for bass, right? Yeah, I mean, that's why hip-hop kind of took off on them, as it could reproduce the heavy bass sounds that they were <laughs> using really well. Um, I mean, I think that to, to your point a little bit more about what how cassettes make music sound, too, it... it kind of flipped the whole idea of authenticity 
in a weird way. I mean, you would think authentic means closest to the original thing, right? So if a high fidelity recording would technically be the most authentic to the music that was being performed when it was recorded, but tapes sound more authentic with their hiss and that because I think mostly because there's not a lot of gatekeepers in between you and the person making that you, you feel like this is what the person wanted me to hear directly. Yeah. No one got in the way of it. Right. Whereas when you hear a studio recording, this is so clean, it's so slick, a million people worked on this thing. Yeah. And it's not nearly as sort of direct in that way. It can be. It's a sure. generalization. But but it, it's sort of like the, the anom anomalies of tape make it more authentic in a strange way. Mm. Yeah, and I think also just circling back on that notion of humanness and right. that that people aren't perfect. And so <laughs> uh, I think there's something charming about the way cassettes present things in a less than idealized mm -hmm. fashion. But of course, that ends up becoming a sort of idealized fashion in a certain right. way. Right. We were talking the other day about how, although cassettes are, you know, quote, uh, old fashioned or out of date or, or you know, not used by the majority of, let's say, younger music listeners now, you go to any boutique guitar maker, guitar pedal maker, and they're creating really, really expensive pedals that make your guitar sound like it was recorded on a crappy cassette, you know? <laughs> That's funny. Or I like didn't actually know about that until you told me. That. Oh, That's yeah. Nice. I mean, I, I love... <laughs> Why not just record onto a cassette? Huh? Well, you can well you can do that, uh, for sure. Um, but this is so it sounds like a cassette coming out of your amp while you're playing live, <laughs> right. which is a oh, nice. whole, yeah, new, whole new level. <laughs> and audio plugins and all of this stuff. It's just mm. funny to me that the... Um, the sort of the, the the murky or blurry qualities of cassettes mm -hmm. are end up being kind of a feature, not a not a bug. Right, and we, we we also were talking the other day about how the 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 concept of a tape itself has this cachet that's some, supposed to be somewhat sort of underground and unofficial and outside of channels, which is why the the biggest example I always think of is rap rap artists will still put out mixtapes, quote unquote, which. They've been going on for 30, 40 years, but maybe in the past 20 years, there hasn't been a single mixtape on cassette. Right. But they still call them mixtapes because it sounds cooler to call it a mixtape than to call it a CDR or a, did you check out my stream or whatever. Mixtape is a cooler. And, and it harkens back to the way mixtapes were made yeah. before, too. And that unofficialness is a yeah. part of the... Because, I mean, oftentimes, if a rapper puts out a, a mixtape, it's like, this isn't an LP. This is like a... It's a right. different kind of statement. You know, right. maybe repurposed stuff, maybe unofficial right, stuff. Right, it's maybe probably bootleg. things that aren't cleared, samples that aren't samples cleared. That aren't cleared. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But that's great, and that also gets right to the point that really as soon as cons a consumer uh, consumers were able to get their hands on cassettes, the music industry freaked out. Right, uh, right. Everybody remembers, oh, maybe some people, does anybody remember the home taping is killing music? We've got a little, uh, yeah, show them, show the picture, little, right? little drawing here. <laughs> of a cassette with a sc skull and crossbones vibe going on because uh, cassettes destroyed the music industry, unfortunately, <laughs> and <laughs> nobody made any money after they were invented. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the British <laughs> British recording industry made that as a as an advertising campaign to try to keep people from taping each other's records and buying them instead. Um, which right. is, if you're familiar at all with the music industry, this somehow is their first go-to solution: is let's <laughs> shame our consumers. Into <laughs> they love <laughs> that. It's yeah. never. It's it's always a. It's always a. Are the kids wrong? Yeah. Uh, am I wrong? No, it's the kids right, that are wrong. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if you if you could see that logo, or you could probably look it up, you'll find it anywhere. I think that makes it look like a cool thing to do. Yeah. It doesn't scare me out of doing it. it makes me want to do it. Because it looks like I'm bucking the the system and I'm I'm screwing the man if I do what, what yeah. those things are asking me not to do. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And I mean, it was hard to say how much it actually did affect uh, mm -hmm. the the record sales, right? I mean, uh, right. I mean, the industry came out with study after study saying we're losing a billion dollars a year, we're losing ten billion dollars a year because of people taping each other's records and not buying them, but. They were always industry studies led by the industry. There was never somebody outside objective saying that this was happening. Right. So it's it's pretty dubious. Yeah. And also, like, that's just one aspect of taping. I mean, people could tape a record and go buy it later or buy an another one from that artist, go see them live. People could be taping other things, making their own music. And there were so many different ways that tapes could be used. Um, the idea that they lost a lot of money, especially because, I mean, they were happy to sell pre-recorded cassettes. Yeah. You know, which you could have just put a piece of tape over top of the <laughs> tabs and re-recorded something on it anyway. So they wanted it both ways in a lot of ways. Sure, sure. 
there were bands, of course, that bands and artists that that fully embraced the idea that there was an audience participation uh, side of this. You mm-hmm. you have a great chapter about one of my favorite bands, the the Grateful Dead. Um, I I I think it was maybe like 2000. 10 when I I started I mean I I liked the dead okay but I I don't remember exactly when Arthur magazine ran they had Mm -hmm. a really really good piece that helped me recontextualize them and I was like I think that's a band that my my uncle listens to the Grateful Dead (laughs) so I was like do you listen to the Grateful Dead and he was like yeah I love the Grateful Dead and he's like do you have a tape deck? And I was like, yeah, I have a, t- I have a tape deck. Cause I kind of knew where we were going, you know? Mm-hmm. So he, he showed up to Thanksgiving with like a, a big collection of dead tapes and he passed them off to me. And I was mm. so excited. Mm-hmm. And then I got home and I started listening to it and I realized it was all like early nineties dead. Uh, and so the MIDI tones were uh-huh. pretty <laughs> brutal on the keyboards. Right. I didn't find right. myself drawn to him so much, <laughs> but right. nonetheless, uh, the Grateful Dead right away encourages fans to mm-hmm. to tape uh, live sets, to trade them, and right. it ends up spawning an entire subculture, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty cool community that they built around the cassette. I mean, they were doing it before cassettes came along, but you had to have a reel-to-reel deck, which was expensive, hard to use, and somehow you had to smuggle that into the show before they were accepting the fact that people could tape their shows. <laughs> um, so cassettes made it a lot easier, a lot more convenient. Um, I mean, my Grateful Dead experience is a little different from yours because I'm older than you, and and I was in college in the '80s, and uh, it was wasn't the greatest phenomenon in the (laughs) world. I mean, nothing against the band itself, but I knew a lot of people who were kind of like faking their dead fandom because everybody was into it, and it just got a little overbearing. So, which is why I've kind of been saying it was really fun to be able to write about them without having to write about the The music, music. (laughs) (laughs) because the community around it is really cool. There's so many people who have made lifelong friendships from taping uh, shows and trading shows and like coordinating are you going to tape this show and I'll tape that show or let or let's all go to this one show and you tape from the board and I'll tape up front and right and, and you know people from all crazy walks of life like s- some of the people I talk to are like doctors lawyers and uh, have pretty much straight laced lives otherwise but they have massive collections of dead tapes and they've been friends for 30 40 years because of it and not to mention that some of the artists in the book who you interview, people like James McNew or uh, Lee Ronaldo specifically, uh-huh. is who I'm thinking of from Sonic Youth, uh-huh. uh, huge deadhead, right? And mm-hmm. hugely into that, essentially, punk notion of the audience is a part of the organism, right? It right. wasn't the stadium rock sort of thing where, you know, mm-hmm. they would have looked down on you taping it because right. you're you're taking, you know, money off their, you know, check right. at the end of the night or whatever. Right. The dead very much seem to view it as a sort of uh, uh, symbiotic thing. Yeah. And when then when you think about how Sonic Youth uh, carried those ethos forward, you yeah. know, without totally. ever really sounding like the right. Grateful Dead. Right, and to the dead's credit, whether or not you like the music, you can't deny that they were changing all the time. And right. that's what spurred people to want to hear tapes of every show. Exactly. Because each show was completely unique in a lot of different ways. And... I mean, I can totally understand that. I mean, I, I feel that way about Sonic Youth in a way. I'd like to hear yeah. one of their shows because they changed up the stuff. They would tape their own shows and listen to them in the van on tour and make decisions about what they were going to play that night based on what they thought worked the night before and, and wouldn't have been able to do that without cassette tapes either. Exactly, exactly. It speaks to that, how how just sim- how simple it is to throw mm-hmm. throw a, t- a tape deck somewhere, yeah. you know? the All the bootlegs that came about that way, right? Uh-huh. Like. The Quine tapes right. weren't those. B- was that? Yeah, a that's Robert Quine. T- I'm not sure if he used cassettes. He but might he, not have used cassettes. Yeah. But the the famous Velvet Underground live at Max's was on a cassette that Bridget Polk from Warhol's Superstar Crew or whatever. Just she had this around with her all the time, and she taped that show. And they decided to put it out on a major label, probably the first like really official bootleg there you ever go. released by a major label. Yeah. The uh, the the bootleg element of it is is very important to the cassettes history um but it's also uh it's also a medium that people are are one of the things i thought was really interesting was the way you focused on not it's not like you're not talking about one genre of music throughout this it's not just rock it's not just you know it really like 
every single scene or uh, little milieu found ways to make the cassette their own and mm -hmm. utilize it in ways that were maybe even unique to just that that scene. Right. Uh, I'm thinking about DJ Screw, who's one uh -huh. of the I th I think one of the heroes of the book and really. Uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about sure. how, how screw tapes got got <laughs> going in Houston? Yeah, well, I mean, sort of the, the, the genealogy is that, that hip-hop in New York was the first thing to sort of spread on a cassette tape. DJ parties would get taped and passed around, and then eventually the DJs figured out, people want these, we're, I'm going to start taping it myself and selling it, and Grandmaster Flash and Brucey e. B and some of these other DJs were making a living off their party tapes, mixtapes. And then sort of parallel, a, little, a few years later, but pretty parallel, in Houston, there was a scene similar where people were selling live tapes, trading live tapes of hip hop stuff happening. And this one guy, DJ Screw, kind of came up with this new version of mixing and DJing where he slowed things down as opposed to either break beating or speeding them up or the things that were happening in New York. And uh, it was, it, they called it chopped and screwed, I guess, at, at one point. And, uh, and it was, yeah, definitely a whole new uh, hip hop sound that, that worked really well on cassette because it was kind of underwater sounding and warpy sounding and it fit really well with cassettes and he would spend hours at home making new mixes and and making cassettes and giving them to people and people started showing up at his house lining up to buy the tapes and eventually he had to put out a sign and say if you want tapes come between seven and nine because there were so many lines of people out out, out front that cops were coming and but trying to bust him being a drug dealer. Right. Thinking he was <laughs> dealing drugs rather than selling tapes. He eventually was able to make a whole store out of this. Yeah. But at that point, it was a little sketchy. Sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. But I just think about what you said about the the underwater quality. Mm -hmm. When I listen to DJ Screw, um, you know, uh, I don't partake in like lean or Robitussin <laughs> serum so much. But the idea of like slowing down dramatically mm -hmm. what you're hearing, um, mm -hmm. you're hearing the manipulation of the s the sampled medium right? Right, right and then that's being layered onto a cassette which right. ends up producing additional mm -hmm. artifacts to right. me it's just like it, it's almost this mobius strip of yeah. of ingenuity and yeah. and strangeness yeah and it's not what you'd expect just from hearing it described no it's way more hypnotic than you would imagine yeah yeah and i'm <laughs> sure it was even more so like coming out of a car stereo oh yeah you know, on a cassette. absolutely yeah. absolutely i love yeah i I'm I'm a huge fan of of DJ Screw. You also talk a lot about you talk you know here in Arizona we've got a few uh, outsider musician legends who who mm -hmm. we can claim as our own and the Bishop Brothers uh, and Sun City Girls and and their label factor into this. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about when? Well, when did you first d did you did you were you into Sun City Girls and then you found the label, or how did, how did it work for you? Yeah, I mean, I guess I found out about them in college and a little bit after, and, and their early releases were all cassette-only type of releases that they were recording onto boom boxes or to four tracks and, and releasing like that, and they got pretty rare pretty quick. Um, so I tried to track as many of those down as I could, and then, you know, l later on in their career, Alan and Rick to an extent, that Alan and Rick are the Bishop brothers, uh, started traveling a lot and going to other countries and digging through like kiosks on the street that had cassettes and trying to find stuff he'd never heard of, stuff that he, that he had heard of but couldn't find anywhere else. And there's this whole history of the cassette in non-Western countries that's even more kind of vital than it was here because not only was it a cheaper and faster way to spread music around, there were more constraints there on what music could get spread around. And the, the, a lot of labels would only put out certain accepted styles of music. The state, the governments, and in some of these countries even would have control over what music got heard, and but they couldn't control tapes. And right. so regional styles and folk styles would get passed around on cassettes, only on cassettes. So when Rick goes, uh, when Alan goes over to Syria or Cairo or whatever and finds these tapes, they might be the only version of these of this music right and he's got a label they put a label together called sublime frequencies that reissues a lot of this music and they've also found a lot of these people i mean in the one of the most sort of more famous although you not necessarily everybody's heard of it but um a wedding singer 
singer uh, named Omar Soliman, who mm -hmm. all his cassettes that were out there, I think, at one point were really just sort of calling cards for him to try to get more work at weddings. Yeah. But Mark Gerges from Sublime Frequencies found them and really liked them and started spreading them around, and they sold well, and now he's come over here and toured a bunch of times. He's super successful compared to where he was before just because they discovered his music on tapes over there. So. Yeah, that's an incredible... His The Omar Suleiman story is so incredible. When mm -hmm. they did a festival here called Form at Arco Santi uh, mm -hmm. a few times, and he performed once, and it was just this, like, I don't know, 200 indie rock hipster types just like totally <laughs> dancing to yeah. this <laughs> wedding music uh -huh, you know and uh -huh. it was it was incredible <laughs> incredible thing and i mean i think that that's you know the the underground you know had a had a tape there was always a, a tape component to the underground so yeah. so whether it's music that in some cases uh i know the sublime frequency stuff you know they would go to some lengths to try to contact the artist, but then also sometimes they didn't know who the artists were. Right, right. <laughs> you well, know, sometimes I mean Brian from another label like this, Awesome Tapes from Africa, has tracked down the people and they're like, "That can't be me. I never put any tapes out." Yeah, <laughs> like Noel, somebody put <laughs> tapes of your music out, even <laughs> if you didn't know about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that <laughs> happens, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you, uh, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about your own your own experience with with tapes. Sure. Tapes were. Uh, Tapes were your one of your early mediums. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, they, they were around when I when I started getting into music, so they they weren't brand new, but they were still kind of well. I guess they'd been around 15, 20 years by then. But so I, I got records first, but I did get tapes pretty soon after, and uh, definitely used them a lot more than I used records, especially like to tape things off the radio. And uh, the real formative thing I remember is when my parents let me save up and they kind of paid half and I paid half for a, a deck in my car in high school that could play tapes. And that was kind of the first, my first experience with this idea that I could take my music out of the house, basically. I mean, besides going to someone else's house and listening to records, yeah. you don't have a way to listen to what you want to listen to uh, outside of the radio, which is dictating a lot of things to you. So that's that was kind of the, what the thing that sort of opened me up to how much cassettes could do. The fact that I could listen to what I wanted to when I was driving around, yeah. either mixtapes I made or even pre recorded I have a lot tons of pre-recorded tapes that were big for me that I never bought on any other format. And, yeah. Um, so that that's the prim primary experience that I had. I mean, I definitely a lot of like sitting the <laughs> at a clock radio and a little handheld cassette player and sitting it next to the radio and waiting on the top 40 thinking this probably this next song's the song I'm looking for is probably around number 20 or something and recording yeah. it and then listening to it over and over and and not only memorizing the song but everything Casey Kasem said before it came on too because I heard that over and over as well. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah, I remember it was always I would always be uh as even as a uh, aspiring radio pirate, I was a sort of a completist. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would always be so pissed off at myself if I missed the first five seconds of the song right. or whatever, you know, right. before I realized that it was, oh, no, it's this. Yeah. <laughs> it's collective soul shine. Uh -huh. I have to hit play you know, or record. <laughs> yeah. um, I, know, I, I know what you mean. Uh, it's funny. That, that reminds me of something I could mention for a second. So there's a whole chapter on sort of personal mixtapes and making tapes for each other and, and making tapes for your friends or getting your friend to tape you a bunch of things. And um, I was recently on the East Coast doing some events like this and one person brought up, did you have like certain go-to songs that were like a minute or two minutes long that you could always put at the end of the tape? And a lot of people said they did. And, and you know, I've mostly been getting a good reception from the people who I've been talking to, but I said, well, sometimes I would just put the rest of the song onto the next side and the whole crowd went, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I didn't realize that was such a like a party foul, <laughs> but appara apparently it was for mixtape makers. I mean, I mentioned uh, I mentioned as a as a Grateful Dead fan, uh, I'm used to having to flip a record mid song. <laughs> right, unfortunately, right, right. Uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I had I I think I think I had a my first car had a tape deck, and while CDs were the the go to medium for me for the most part. Um, you know, I got, I got a car that had a tape deck in it, so I just right. started buying tapes, right. started taping CDs mm -hmm. uh, onto tapes so that I could take that uh -huh. stuff with making mixtapes. And then, of course, there was the cool technology where you had a little tape adapter that you could <laughs> right. plug into a CD player yeah. or later iPod. And right, right. so uh, that mm -hmm. was, that was it was major. But what you're talking about, the sort of like take your music with you, uh, that's another thing where the tape mm -hmm. really... Walkman's, oh, oh, so the Sony Walkman, when that gets introduced, 
that I mean, aside from s- some boom boxes, right. nobody really had that experience of putting your headphones on and just mm-hmm. walking around listening to right. what you want. Now yeah. we can do that yeah. all the time, and I don't think we necessarily realize how that was a new thing that people oh, could yeah. do. They were able to soundtrack their existence in very different ways due to the portability of the cassette. Yeah, I think it's hard sort of to imagine. I mean, I I guess I somewhat experienced it because there were before I got that car tape player i didn't take my music out with me but i I still don't really remember it because it seems like such a given now that you can have your own music wherever you want to at any given point right and and have it have sort of a personal music experience all the time which i think basically not only to introduce that it introduced the idea of music as part of your personality more so i mean there were record collectors who thought that but I, i don't think everybody in the world thought of it the way i think pretty much everybody now who's into music at all thinks music is part of me i take it where i go i listen to what i want to listen to right. it, i have this appendage <laughs> either my phone or the walkman back then that's like part of me yeah and that's a pretty big change from it being sort of like record collectors and audiophiles being the people who were most identifying with the things that they listened to or recorded that's right and it's so much and it enabled so much of a of a more social dynamic mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. because how easy is it to give someone a tape or to right. you know what i right. mean or like that's the thing. You if you if you make somebody a tape, I mean, y- you're giving them a gift, and, and you don't, you know, it's like you're loaning them all your favorite stuff, but you don't yeah. have to ask for it back. You <laughs> right, know what I mean? Right. But uh, then the irony was the one when the Walkman got introduced. One of the major controversies was this is so antisocial. Now everybody's wearing headphones and not talking to each other on the street, and yeah. not, as if. I mean, I don't remember before I had a Walkman talking to anybody in the street, but, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe more people were doing that before it came along. I, I don't know. But I mean, it's funny when when Sony invented its first version of it. It's true. The the guy who owned Sony insisted that it had to have a little device where two people could listen and talk to each other because he's like, no one's going to want to just sit there listening to music by themselves. Of course, that's what everybody wanted to do. Right. The minute right. it got popular. Yeah. 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 That's interesting to think about. Um, the notion of making tapes for people and trading tapes, you know, there's something so romantic about it. You, you cite, I was thinking, you know, what are other great books about cassettes? Rob Sheffield's Love is a Mixtape mm-hmm. is not really about cassettes. <laughs> right. It's about his, his wife and, and her, her death and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and their courtship and all these other beautiful things. But I think that, the 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 romance of you know you can make people a playlist now instantaneously and right. and people appreciate playlists and they love playlists mm-hmm. but when somebody makes you a tape you really know that they 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 sat there through right. each song on it you know yeah. they they had to to put together a uh, some sort of narrative Mm -hmm. in their head of how these songs were going to flow together. You're getting so much more than just however many songs are included on that tape. You're maybe getting a J card with, you know, their handwriting or Mm -hmm. art or who knows what. I just think of it as such an interesting way that the object becomes a piece of art or representational in its own right. Yeah, a communication tool and a way to connect with people. And also, there's kind of an interesting idea of trying to communicate to somebody through a communication media. So so I'm going to line up these songs and maybe try to say something to this person through these songs, but the songs themselves have connotations and iterations and I'm not sure how they you know you have no idea how they're going to take it are they even going to listen to it all at once or they you know I've, I mean the cliche with mixtapes from like movies and books is that they were basically made to to try to uh, get someone to go out with you or to, <laughs> to court somebody right. which is I mean I have an example of, a, of, of someone in the book who she listened to this mixtape she got from a guy for many times before she realized that the first letter of each song spelled out i like you <laughs> 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 which i mean i don't know who you know obviously that's pretty that's pr- it's pretty good yeah. it's pretty good um but i think there were so many other purposes too to, to spread music to to try to get people into the music you were into to try to brag about your record collection or whatever and and a playlist is just like you know first of all you're li- you're you're dictated to by whatever streaming service you're doing it on. It looks the same as every other playlist. There's no difference. In, there's no really personalization of it. And it also just, I mean, I, I'm not against it per se, I, but it doesn't have the same kind of quality. I don't think it's really super comparable because I, I think the metaphor I came up with the other day, which is not in the book because I'm not sure if it's really, really a great metaphor, but it's sort of like 
do you want to cook a meal by getting all the ingredients yourself and putting it all together? Or do you want to list the ingredients on a screen and just hit, you know, hit cook? Right. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. that's, if you could do that and you need and you need the convenience and don't have the time, fine. I'm not against it. Yeah. But it, it doesn't have the same magic that ma- mixtapes have. Yeah, you miss out on all that extra context that ends up creating right, right. creating the magic, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. No, I uh I definitely remember finishing a J card on a mixtape that I had made for somebody and realizing this hand my handwriting makes me look like a psychopath. I have to start <laughs> over. <laughs> so I just like went and got another one, <laughs> you know, and just yeah. threw it away, <laughs> you know, right, and started right. over. Because uh-huh. it's like uh-huh. every element of it has right. to be considered. You right. know, you yeah. wanna I don't want her to who who is Akkad for, you know, like right. you know, it's like, no, that's just my terrible yeah. handwriting. I mean, anyway. going back to the dead, there are people who have collections that are all that they value because every person who gave them one wrote it the way they wanted. There, but there are some people who are like, do not write on the tape. Right. Just send me a list of what's on it, and I have to write it exactly the way I want. I want every one of the tapes <laughs> to look exactly the same in my writing and in my format. Not to mention all <laughs> the incredible art on those tapes. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and that you can just look up archives of mm-hmm. hand-drawn, you mm-hmm. know, often sometimes extremely ornate. It depends. Mm-hmm. You know, you get all sorts of stuff. Right. Uh, and the dude running by just by coincidence the dude who runs the dad's archives now was a taper that's how he got david Lemu- uh, yeah, Lemieux. Yeah, yeah yeah cool guy and he and yeah he, he started by being a taper and just got so ensconced in the community that he eventually w- started working for them yeah so. now he manages their yeah, tape archive their entire archive, their yeah. Entire yeah. archive yeah. which is which is mm-hmm. in, uh, immense uh yeah well i mean i just like i said I, the book is is so fun and it doesn't end up feeling like you tell somebody like this is a book about cassettes and and I'm sure somebody's like, OK, so technical schematics or, you know, <laughs> right. uh, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's not that you don't include t- technical details, but you manage to tell all these great stories and oh, all thanks. of these um, all these sort of like adventure tales, each one that helps to broaden the top, you know, the conversation about what mm-hmm. cassettes mean. Uh but I was really psyched. You you made a cassette to go <laughs> right. with to go along right. with it. Um, yeah, this is it. <laughs> was that w- 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 how far into the book were you when you were like, I'm going to make a tape with it, or did you sort of have it in your head the whole time? Uh, I think I finished the book when I decided that I mean, my my ultimate goal would have been well, the really ultimate goal would be to be have a book on tape reading it, but that would be like five cassettes and. Um, Look, all <laughs> I wouldn't I'm say- expect anybody to sit through that. All I'm <laughs> saying is, we need to make it happen. <laughs> right. I want, I want to see that. <laughs> right. I want to see but high bias on tape. <laughs> the other idea would be to have a sampling of all the kind of music I talk about, but the rights and things would be crazy. So what I did was I focused on in the last chapter. I talk about current resurgence of tapes and the way it's being used now and I talk about a bunch of the tape labels that make the music that I like there's so many more than what I talk about but I talk about those labels and I asked many of them each to give me a track from their catalog and that's what's on here that's awesome so it, it it turned out great and it's Thanks. cool to see that like you said there is like a whole there's a whole there's a world of people currently who are us- utilizing this medium and mm-hmm. I started this off by talking about vinyl and talking about the resurgence it's had. I love records. I collect records. I'm mm-hmm. lifelong record nerd, but cassettes right now, they're the underdog. They're way cooler. <laughs> yeah. They're way cooler. Yeah, mm-hmm. I might even argue that CDs are almost cooler than <laughs> vinyl at this <laughs> right. moment. But well, go into cycles. We'll, 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 <laughs> you know, we, that's, that's a topic yeah. for another, uh, another day. <laughs> but I, mean, I um, do think the cool thing about music formats in general, all these ones that have hung on, is they each have strengths and weaknesses that the other ones don't. Yeah. There's, some, there's no f- perfect format. That's and, right. And there's things that are great about tapes that aren't good about CDs and vinyl and vice versa. And that's why, I mean, if you're into physical media, you're probably into all of them because they all have cool things about them. Absolutely. But I think sometimes the cool things about cassettes get a little obscured under the idea that they're not high quality or right. they're not, they're, you know, or they're fragile, which they are. Right. But they have a lot of other strengths. That's one thing is everybody would say, well, cassettes, they'll, they'll wear out so much quicker than other mediums. Mm-hmm. But you were showing me you've got some really old tapes <laughs> that do. still play great, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, and I've got some CDs that don't. So <laughs> <laughs> it can happen with anything. Perfect sound yeah. forever, not so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was the CD. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess tapes, their logo would be imperfect sound forever. <laughs> right. um, and I think imperfect that's sound better. for a while. <laughs> yeah, for a while. <laughs> 
that's awesome. Yeah. Should we open it up to Sure, if anybody has any. Does, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or want to add anything? Or, or do you want to tell us about what if you had tapes growing up or tapes mean anything to you? Yeah. Okay. Lauren, we've communicated we haven't met yet. So nice to hear you. Thanks for that. It was really fascinating. Um I have a story and a couple of questions. My story is that when I made mixtapes, I used to make double mixtapes and I was really specific about them fitting in a tape rack. So I used to glue the two cases together so they'd open like that with little bits of foam that were exactly the right size so they'd fit in someone's tape rack. Oh, wow. So that's what I did for my tapes. So my questions are, one is a really quick question, what do people listen to tapes on now? Because I listen on my Walkman still and players from thrift stores. But when young people like buy my tapes at shows, what they, what they listen to them on? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, it is hard to find decent sort of mid-range decks anymore except for at, at thrift stores i mean there's cheap kind of knockoff walkmans on amazon and stuff but i don't know how well those do I, I and think yeah and there are some like boutique companies now right. like sort of like um making cool little minimalistic tape tape right. decks but they're but it, it's basically a walkman you know but yeah, yeah they the technology is a little bit um yeah, it's not as easy to just go to the store and buy one. Yeah, it is. I do wonder, people who are buying tapes on the new labels, what... I mean, I think there's a decent amount of them who... People who buy them and download the uh, digital audio and just like to have supported the band, got something physical from them, paid them more than they'd make if they streamed the... Re you know, that kind of... I think that's a big part of it, too. Um, but, they, I mean, I, I've found a bunch of uh, good component tape decks in thrift stores. So that's what I always recommend people do, because... Or if you want to, I have a few if you want to buy one. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to highbias.bandcamp.com. He's going to start listing, <laughs> listing the, uh, the used decks. Did as you well. have another question? And it might be a bit off topic, but I'm, I am curious about how you know, these decade old media, so vinyl, we see performed on stage a lot. And tape, of course, real true tape was. And I do know a lot of artists that do use tape live and installation, but it's not got the same sort of performative aspect as right, turntables uh, throughout a variety of genres. Do you have any thoughts on, on why that? Yeah, so you're asking if, if about, about people that do that, if there are people that no, use it? I know there are, but uh -huh. certainly not the same, right? Oh, yeah, right, no. Yeah, I mean, especially in, like, DJing and stuff, tapes, are, it's pretty rare. I mean, I know Brian Shimkovitz from Awesome Tapes from Africa does that with the tapes he finds in. But I mean, it's it's super complicated <laughs> way to DJ, so it's not the easiest thing in the world. In terms of, there are certainly still people who perform with cassettes as a as an instrument, um, you know, putting samples or field recordings on them and mixing them live and things like that. That definitely still happens. Um, I mean, I like I do really like the idea of DJing with tapes, but it's a complicated I've process. I've, <laughs> I've seen it done, but yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, yeah it's and it's not, not a. <laughs> It's uh, it's also one of those things where you can eyeball on a record exactly where the yeah, song starts yeah. versus the tape, which is a little bit more uh, uh -huh. it's, it's harder to locate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that performative aspect of it, though, you're right, because even when you see CDJ like DJs who aren't even using records, they still have the turntable. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do. I, Deb, I, I talk a little bit just briefly about house music, and and in when it came up in Chicago, there were DJs doing that who were using cassettes, not only to DJ with, but they would like tape part of what they had played on turntables and put that back into the mix of things they were doing, or get music from people who were making music locally and be able to DJ it like right away rather than waiting for it to be pressed up on record. So that was pretty prominent in that scene, as far as I know. Um, so uh, Jason was talking a little bit earlier about how like mixtapes were such a great opportunity to kind of make an art object out of sharing your music with somebody. And I've got so many mixtapes that are like you know collages or line drawings or Ooh. that sort of thing. I'm wondering if you talk about this in the book about whether artists took advantage of that to make art objects out of their own releases. I think about this because like I remember like Eugene Chadbourne used to do. Yeah. All, I, I once bought a Eugene Chadbourne cassette that was in a child's shoe, which yeah. you, know, you can't do that with a record. You can't do that with a CD. <laughs> yeah. Maybe do with a cassette. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something in the underground culture where you were kind of like making art objects out of the cassette. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a whole chapter that's called Cassettes Underground that's about artists like that. And I mentioned Eugene, the, the one that I mentioned in there is he had an album called Dirty Sock, and it was three tapes in a dirty sock. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a big, I mean, it, it kind of grew out of the whole mail art scene where people would mail each other artworks 
or or say if you want an artwork from me, send me an envelope and I'll send you back. And once cassettes came out and were so easy to use and so cheap, people who were in that scene who were also sound artists or musicians were took advantage of that a lot. And I mean, definitely like like I could have filled a whole chapter just with the examples that I've heard about about people, you know, going to a thrift store and buying an old old doll and and <laughs> cutting it out and putting the tape in there. And apparently in the eighties the post office was much more lenient about what they would send if you put a stamp on it and an <laughs> address. <so laughs> uh but yeah, that was a big that was definitely a big part of it. The, the it's definitely got so many uh opportunities as an as an art piece, not just the packaging and the way it looks, but like a lot of these underground artists would take a tape and say, I'm gonna put this on track one, I'm gonna send it to you, put something else on track two, and then send it to somebody you know, and eventually it would become this sort of massive noise collage on one cassette that only, you know, the final person who got it could hear all of the <laughs> music on. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, I kind of started out ahead of the curve, uh -huh. with a Panasonic, Oh, portable nice. recorder. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying, when I saw about this, I was trying to remember, okay, what was my first uh -huh. tape deck? Yeah. And, you know, it was like the 1970, it had, it came with like a little microphone, uh -huh. ear, earbuds, right. and stuff. So I'd like to make, record stuff off the radio, or right. records, and I'd carry it with me just uh -huh. when I walked to school. And nice. Oh, that's awesome. And that was really good. Yeah, and like half of it's a speaker too, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, those are great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's definitely what I used to tape things off the radio. I would set that right next to a clock radio and hit record. And yeah, those were those were awesome. I love. I have. I have. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I have one kind of like that that I bought maybe 15, 20 years ago that still works fine. I mean, I think you can still find those around that that still work pretty well. Yeah. So anyway. First of all, thanks for writing the book and being here and posting it. This is awesome. And then secondly. When you were talking about the mixtapes, my experience was that a lot of people, I always thought of them as tape shamans, because they would have um, you know, a collection of mixtapes, or they would make one for you, and you would tell them, oh, I lost my job, or I broke up, or I did this thing. And they'd be like, oh, I have the, either I have the perfect <laughs> tape for you, or I'll come back in a couple days, and I'll make one. And so I always felt there was this key lead, like in some mixtapes, that when you talk about the relationship, it was like, okay, this is, you know, either for you because they have like 200 mixtapes and not the right one, or I'll make you one for that situation, which was real honor. But I don't know if you experienced that. Or yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. To yeah, to I mean, you the the first I was. It's just funny. The first um, the the first place that I wrote about music. Uh, Saying professionally doesn't feel correct, but semi-professionally was a website called Tiny Mixtapes, uh, mm -hmm. and <laughs> Tiny Mixtapes had a section where you could just write in with whatever your scenario is. Uh -huh. Somebody would, uh, you know, assemble a track list for you. Uh -huh. So to what to your point, like it's it that's that's really great to think about. I never had anybody. I don't know if I ever encountered anything quite as cool as what you described, but. Right. But the spirit, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, a couple of the mixtape maker type people that I talked to in the book had these kind of like, like, um, especially musically themed kind of like ones where like, uh, like this is all the solo stuff from Big Star on one tape, or this is like what would have happened if this band had stayed together. I think they would have sounded like these ten bands or things like that. And I like the the what if Beatles tape where you take right. a, a you know you comprise the another Beatles album using <laughs> songs from everybody's first solo record right. or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. I also love the. I mean, it seems like the more we talk about this, I talk about this with people, the more it has these weird overlaps with drug dealing. Because <laughs> the fact that this guy was like, I can hook you up with whatever mixtape you need. You know, <laughs> there's a, a funny story in the in the section that's about concert taping that, where I talk about how the Grateful Dead taping thing has moved on to new generations. And Brian White's from Animal Collective. I talked to him about it, and he was like middle school or maybe even grade school and he his uncle or something had showed him a dead tape and, he, and another kid in school was like there's a teacher here who will hook you up with dead tape so he <laughs> went up to the classroom and hung out there until class was over and he said i heard you can make and he gave him a bunch of t and it just seems so weirdly illicit especially at a grade school Dude, i don't know i just love the overlap love so that, that. <laughs> it, feel, it feels as cool as drug dealing and not, I know as, and not as bad <laughs> yeah that's funny that's funny to think about <laughs>
Does anybody else have any other any other thoughts or anything they want to share? Anybody have any cool experiences with cassettes? <laughs> I'll th- I'll share one to get us started just a tiny bit. But okay. I we were talking about the f- my th- the first car I had had a, a tape deck in it, and I remember going to a thrift store in town. There weren't any proper record stores where I lived, but I would go to this thrift store and scour through tapes, and I saw it was an Elvis Costello tape, Blood and Chocolate, which is a really, really good record. But I didn't have any idea, and I actually had only heard about Elvis Costello from from bands. So I was like, whatever, I'll take this. So I was listening to it, and I was I remember driving around, and I remember the last song on the first side is the song I Want You, which is a very creepy song. <laughs> Hard to imagine. Elvis, Elvis Costello <laughs> has some creepy songs. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's this really creepy song, but it was... It was like I had heard lots of, I had heard you know lots of music from the seventies, but there was this eerie like drone going on. It was this whole, it, I just I was like in these like kind of creepy lyrics, and I was fe- I felt so uncomfortable, and it just sounded insane, you know, this noise. And uh, when the tape finished, I was like, I I don't, I have you know that's like Velvet Underground's heroin or something. <laughs> So I re- rewound it and I like pressed play and the all the drone was gone the hum was gone something had just gotten nice. like stuck on the wow. on the tape or whatever or while it was going through so it it sounded kind of messed up but it didn't have that same weird quality yeah. and so now every time I hear I want you by Elvis Costello <laughs> I think like this is pretty scary but it could be way creepier you mean <laughs> you you might have died I might that you might know? have been I, this is <laughs> and this is heaven <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, uh, th- I think that tapes are just such a, like you said, they're such a personal thing, so mm-hmm. if anybody has anything. They're, it's things, but I, I can't say that they're cool, but they're <laughs> more nerdy applications of tape, cassette tape, but as an example, like I try to preserve film strips, and so those little things with the beep and you sure. twist the knob, and cassette tapes for like 20 years were a huge part of film strips. Because you know the teacher would play a film strip, and you know after a while records weren't part of that. It was cassette tapes, and then there was that little beep sound, and the human would change it. So I also experienced a lot of coolness in the cassette tapes being used in like other situations. Like there's music on it, but it's also micro learning. Mm Yeah, I mean, there, I, w- we had one of the first compu- personal computers at home that I can remember anybody having in our neighborhood, and you had you could back up onto cassette tapes, like back up the code. And of course, the first thing I did was, what what that, that sounds like? And it's this weird, like, blippy Morse code noise kind of thing, which I, I feel like had an influence on me getting into noise music, was listening to those <laughs> weird tapes. <laughs> um, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, my, ours was like a TI-99 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing for, that I was reminiscing on when I heard you talk is kind of like all the other things, like if you miss a seminar, they have it on tape. Or if there was an audio book, it was on tape. And so there was this whole, like, I don't know, pres- like before cassette tapes, if you miss something, you miss something. Right. You know, but, but there was a window of time, 10, 20 years, where if you miss that event, someone might be selling a cassette, or right. there'd be a book on cassette that you could listen to in your car. Right. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar, if you ever heard of this thing called the uh, the C1 deck. It's a Library of Congress made deck for, for books, audio books for the blind. And it has all these kind of extra controls that most tape decks at the time didn't have in terms of changing the speed and the pitch. And, and it's become kind of a coveted object for artists who use tapes, like especially underground noise artists, because you can manipulate the tapes like crazy and you can make all different sounds come out of it. And I have talked to a couple of people who use it in the book. And I only recently found since the book got published that the Library of Congress doesn't want those circulating for some reason. And if they find them, they'll destroy them. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. which is wild. I'm not exactly sure why, but yeah, I guess they were only intended to ever be used for blind people. So, yeah, There's but some proprietary technology <laughs> or I something. Guess. In there, I guess I don't so know. Yeah, oh, it's, it's it's wild. We'll have to find out. So. That's to me what the the tape part of it is is that it 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 made things more micro. Like like with the record, you had to have a big enough audience that whatever 
hundred thousand, tens of thousands, millions, but cassette exactly. tapes allowed you to have to okay. like much more customized. Yeah. That's right. Totally. Yeah, you can dash off a few tapes right before a gig and have something at, for sale at the merch table that you know is completely uh, unique to that show. Yeah, for sure. I'm just getting so nostalgic, but I think for me, cassettes just brought up so much curiosity with sound, so of course recording off the radio, high speed dubbing, all that kind of stuff, but a really sort of pivotal thing in my life was, you know, all those Beatles things about backwards recordings and actually getting my dad's four track and playing that bit of After Blackbird and Strawberry Fields and hearing all, you know, all those uh, kind of conspiracy myths and legends around it and being able to do that physically and sort of experiment with it. It's just that's, that's cool. Um, I could tell one story that I've, I've, uh, that I've really liked that happened at one of the events that I've had for these uh, books. So I, one my, my co-host at one event was Jeff Krulik, a filmmaker whom he's most famous for having made Heavy Metal Parking Lot, if you're familiar with that movie. But he, in order, for the event, he went back to his parents' house and got a bunch of old tapes that he had, and he found this box of tapes that just said one, numbered one through 12, nothing else on them. He started listening to them, and they were interviews that he had done with his grandmother. Yeah, so he's like, and he got obsessed with them again, and he started listening to them, listening, and then he gets to tape 12, and she's in the middle of some great story, and a whole Kansas album comes on. <laughs> 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 so apparently when he was a kid, it wasn't quite as valuable to him as it <laughs> is now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which, um, which it like leads me to the thought of media prejudice. Like, like people value stories, right? And if they were a streamed story, mm -hmm. people would maybe preserve it. But because it's on tape, then it's just scheduled to be right. gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a f ephemeral thing to tapes for sure. Which, uh, good and bad <laughs> ephemeral things with tapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the media preservation element of it is is, is something worth worth thinking about. But mm -hmm. I think that yeah, they they the the underdog quality extends in multiple for good and bad, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. they do feel more disposable to people, perhaps. Right. Right. Um, and in a weird sense, that's a, another thing I like about them too. Yeah. In some weird, in some weird way, yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's not precious. And right. I like the lack of preciousness when right. it comes to tapes. Totally. For sure. Me too. Yeah. That's a very uncool story and a quick question, if I can speak about it. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Phoenix when I was a teenager, and I think it was a radio station called The Edge. I had a blue box, two deck, and I, every Sunday um, there was this ska punk show that came on. That night, Craven Moorhead hosted it. He was just telling me about this. Oh, right? really? All right. Well. And <laughs> yeah. I used to record every single one of those onto a tape and I just <laughs> buy like a bunch of tapes because I didn't have any to like record over. So I've got those somewhere. Probably a year's worth of recording if I dig through my parents' storage. Oh, yeah. like that. I know no one wants it. But oh, <laughs> that's awesome. No, I I was I was telling Mark. That's so funny. He before just I was like, yeah, every Sunday night we would tape the Scott Punk show <laughs> and I was like and they the radio station would play Blink-182 or Green Day during the week but they wouldn't play Fugazi or all the stuff that Craven would play I also told Mark that I was probably like 32 before I realized Craven Moorhead was a like a, a crude pun. a crude uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just thought I thought it was that was his that was name, his real name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, it was not. I was way older than I should have been when I realized. Oh wait! <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of strange because like stars, you know, skews so young. So it's kind yeah, of for sure. Um, question. Um, so like obviously the advent of CDs made tapes like you know like not as uh, pervasive and stuff like that. So right. like '90s through the 2000s up until like this last 10 years of like tape just being more available and like tape labels coming up and stuff. Were there any like in your research and stuff or just your knowledge like genres or subgenres that like kind of just like, stayed with tapes like all along? Like I know that like you know, black metal and like noise yeah. has like always been like tapes right. has always been like the go-to for that. Sure. So I imagine that just like carried on throughout. Like were there any other like cool 
subgenres and stuff that you discovered that kind of just like never stopped with it. Taking yeah, I think the only one, although it got pretty into CDs too, was probably New Age. There were still people putting New Age tapes out through all that time just because they were so used to that format. And New Age is the one thing that I kind of regret that I didn't dip into for this book because there's a whole New Age tape culture too. I just never was able to kind of find a hook, an angle to that, that really worked for that. But um, I think that was one genre. Definitely noise and underground music did. And I mean, the 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 one of the main manufacturers is still around where a lot of labels get their tapes made, where I got this tape made, called National Audio Company. Um, they survived by putting out, by finding other weird ways that people needed tapes, like churches would come to them, and they, we need 20,000 copies of this sermon to distribute to our congregation and things like that. And Because a lot of the plants went away, of course. And so I, I think that all, some of them had to move into non-musical areas because there just weren't enough people putting music on tapes anymore. Yeah, that's where I'm from. Oh, cool. I worked at a record store in Springfield, and when I was getting ready to move out here, I'm a teacher. But I continued working at the record store even after being a teacher. And when my wife and I were relocating, the store finally went out of business, and like three guys I worked with ended up working at National. Oh, Park. oh really? That's cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to check that place. That looks really cool. And they basically... Even when the tape seemed completely dead, when another company would go out of business, they'd buy all their equipment, thinking we're going to want this if it ever comes back. And I mean, it was pretty pr smart of them because they are the main place now to go get tapes made. Yeah. So, so, do you think you could do a sequel on just new age tapes? Maybe is that the? Uh, is that <laughs> I mean, the plan? somebody definitely <laughs> should write that. I don't. I don't know that. I like new age to an extent. <laughs> I think I'd get a little tired of it writing a whole book about it. But somebody definitely should do that. I mean, it definitely is interesting how so many. I mean, I remember going into sort of like crystal yoga kind oh, of yeah. shops and them still having cassettes when, when record stores weren't having them anymore, you know. So. For sure. Do we do we need to wrap up or are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. everybody, thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, Mark, yeah. thanks for writing this great book. Oh, and sure. if you ha if you don't have a copy, they've got them here. Yep. And I'm sure Mark will Happy sign it sign and everything too, like yeah, that. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, just thanks for sharing your stories and everything, too. That's the most fun about this is it's such a... Everybody has some cool stories about cassettes. So. Thank you all. Thanks very much.